Hi, everybody. Welcome. Today's webinar is part of a series that, um, that EMA are doing um, on uh, COVID. And this one in particular is on hospitals and COVID, where we are succeeding and where we are failing. We really want to develop a learning culture um, here in Europe. So a lots of chance to hear practical, real information that you can use um, uh, immediately. Um, uh, just to walk you through the, the format of how we're going to run today. Um, we have to mute everyone's microphones just to make sure that the sessions run smoothly and you can hear the presenters clearly. If you have any comments or any questions at any time, feel free to put them into the chat box. Um, and then we're going to go through the two presentations. And at the end of the presentations, we'll get to your comments and to your, um, uh, to your questions. And we do that just to make sure that we make the best efficient use of time. Everything is recorded and we have a, a dedicated web page where we, where we make available not just the recordings but any other information that's related to these the webinars. So do feel free to visit those. And I'll now um, introduce you to the two speakers. Um, oh, sorry, the agenda. So on the agenda, we're going to see two perspectives, as I mentioned, one from um, Helsinki uh, from Finland and one from Portugal. So we have the great honour of um, having Dr. Marku Makiavi with us and he will present first on his um, on. Um, what he's seen in um, Finland. And then on the other side of Europe, we'll hear from Dr. Alexandra Lorenko, who is an EMA board member and the president of the Portugal Association of Hospital Managers. So without further ado, I'll hand you over Dr. to Dr. Marku Machiavi. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, George, and hello, everybody. My name is Marku Machiavi. I'm the chief medical officer of the Helsinki University Hospital. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a short story covering our COVID-19 uh, adventure till now from the very beginnings. First of all, this is the map uh, of the hospital district we are covering in the middle down. You see Helsinki, that's the capital of Finland with some 600,000 inhabitants. And then there are 23 other cities surrounding that. Uh, altogether, 1.7 million people we are covering uh, and providing uh, secondary and tertiary healthcare services. This is our organizational map in brief. Uh, we are divided in four different hospital areas. The biggest one is the Helsinki University Hospital area. Roughly 80% of our activities, patients, budget, and, and also personnel with all 50 specialties in uh, current uh, Western medicine. Uh, other three uh, hospital areas are much smaller, uh, kind of a more uh, central hospital, county hospital type of setups. Uh, then we have, of course, all the support functions, a few companies owned by us, uh, like uh, real estate, and uh, also a, a company providing uh, medical services uh, outside our borders. Uh, we run 23 hospitals uh, currently, uh, over 200 uh, places of care. Yearly, we take care of uh, almost 700,000 different patients. Uh, currently, we are 27,000 employees. Uh, close to 3,000 beds, uh, and uh, total budget is close to 3 billion. Close to 100,000 100, surgeries, uh, close to 500 organ transplants, and uh, over 3,000 doctors, uh, 15,000 nurses. So very large health system, I would say, but no primary care. So all primary care is run by the municipalities and, and we do very tight cooperation with them. Uh, the important pandemia timelines for us uh, this spring were first uh, preparations after seeing the news from China started uh, January 23rd in my organization then a few days later, the first uh, COVID case and a patient in Finland, in Lapland. Early February, we started with our COVID executive group, which is still running a meeting currently every day, nine o'clock. 
uh, end of February, we finally got the first positive uh, COVID patient in our hospital. Uh, and he went, uh, we, uh, went to the ward, but not to the ICU. First ICU patient close to middle of March. Uh, and uh, what is uh, very important also are the different activities by the government, by the state. And, and uh, March 16th, we got the Emergency Powers Act in Finland, which means that uh, the ministries and the government can directly uh, drive the functions in different organizations, also in our organization. And almost immediately thereafter, we uh, increased our preparedness state to the maximum, which in our case means that the chief medical officer is in charge of all functions, uh, not the CEO. March 27th, um, we had an event called Uusima lockdown. That's the, our district uh, geographically was locked. All the roads were blocked, blocked and only very necessary traffic was allowed. This lasted a little bit over two weeks and uh, partly slowed down the epidemic in Finland. Very soon the schools will open. We start to uh, unravel the restrictions uh, st step by step, but it will be a, a, a long and, and slow process over the summer. So what then happened? Uh, the, here in the green curve, you see the the tests, the samples taken. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't have enough uh, laboratory capacity in Finland. It took some time and effort to, uh, to ramp it up. Currently, we can take some uh, 4,500 tests uh, in whole Finland, and we are aiming to 10,000. The red curve shows you how many positive cases we have had per day. So single ones in the beginning. But at the, after the mid-March, uh, they started to come. And uh, last days, we have had positive cases between 50 and, and 100 in our area, and, and 200, 300 in whole Finland. Uh, this shows uh, how it really concentrates on the capital area. So red one is Helsinki, and uh, the orange one is Espoo, that's the neighboring city and then Vanta. So in these three big cities in the capital area, some uh, 1 million plus inhabitants, there is the real epidemic. And, and outside that, it's very rare in Finland. Uh, this is the prognosis done by our artificial intelligence group. The black dots are uh, measurement points, uh, uh, in, including the need for the ICU treatment and then uh, you have this estimated two options the green one is the so-called p50 most likely and very nicely we actually follow that the p95 the red one is the worst case scenario which uh, luckily uh, till now never happened uh, so um, hopefully we will stay in the green zone also in the future this is the model we developed our Selves, and it's not including this R0. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, made by, by other factors. So this is uh, the patients in the wards during this uh, last two months. As you see in the very beginning, only single cases. Then uh, later March, uh, it increases and then closes up to 100. Now it's around 50. Uh, this is the... Um, ICU patient curve, you see that we go up to close to 50 patients a day, and then it starts to come down, but still we are around 30 patients a day. Uh, red ones are new patients, green ones are patients out of ICU, so there is a traffic in both ways currently. So the epidemic is going on, but not very strongly. Mortality in ICU, 12%, which is good. Good result. Uh, this is the situation in overall Finland. Confirmed cases close to five and a half thousand currently. Number of tests taken 110,000. 
a little bit uh, more female cases uh, positive tested, but uh, in hospital we have more male, especially in ICU. This is our rough estimate what's going to happen. So we've seen the first wave uh, now in March, April. Summer will be quite okay, but uh, August, September, probably the second wave. And if it goes like this uh, in winter, the third wave. So you have to prepare your organization for all of these waves, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, what we then did and what we learned um, with uh, the Emergency Powers Act, we centralized the leadership, reorganized 23 hospitals. So they are run as one hospital, not as five hospital areas. Every day, weekday, nine o'clock, there's a status report meeting. It's done online. All chiefs of functional, 50 functional units are connected and, and everything necessary is informed. Uh, the decision execution is very fast with minimal bureaucracy and uh, it's been very effective. Um, communication is one of the key issues. You have to be able to communicate your personnel, what you are doing and why, and also give uh, uh, guidance for using the personal protective equipment and, and that kind of stuff, but also externally it's very important to, to inform the society and government what you are doing and why uh, and, and you have to use all the different media uh, modalities website bulletin videos streaming everything you got and it seems that uh, that this is uh, this it, it was never in, in enough information <laughs> and you also sometimes misunderstood very easily Currently, we have close to 100 doctors and 1,000 nurses uh, uh, in treating COVID patients or, or in training, mostly surgical personnel. And of course, this has consequences for our organization. Elective surgery is very much down, acute surgery a little bit. ED visits, uh, luckily, are down. People don't want to come for some reason and 80% of elective ambulatory visits are done uh, either remote or then postponed. Telemedicine with all the different options is recommended. And maybe you could say that this uh, COVID-19 has done uh, a big favor for our digitalization efforts in, in, in different uh, disciplines. Before, before this, it was only mainly talk, but now you really have to do something for your patients and, and, and all doctors and nurses are in favor of that. After this, or already now, we see increased waiting times. Uh, we have some 40,000 patients in, in queuing up for our services. Some have worsened their symptoms. Of course, there are cancers not detected, not uh, being treated. And the economical consequences uh, are quite large. Uh, in our scale, we estimate that 200 million euros this year and then 50 million euros plus next year. But nobody really knows how big bill this COVID-19 will cost for us. But um, in summary, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic hasn't been very severe, nothing like Italy, France, uh, Spain, or even Sweden in Finland, but still it has caused uh, a lot of changes in the in healthcare organizations, and we had to prepare orderly in, in, in able to treat all the scenarios. Luckily, the, the, the mildest scenario realized. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was a terrific and informative presentation. I can see um, a few questions have come through, which we'll get to after the next speaker. Uh, so my, my, most of my presentation follows the, the, the topic of the um, webinar. Um, and one of the, the things I think that is more striking from, um, uh, from the pandemic is the level of uncertainty uh, and the need to continuous improvement of the healthcare system. 
of course, at the beginning, we were um, feeling that uh, uh, the healthcare system were, would be completely overwhelmed, as we have seen uh, in uh, Italy or Spain. Fortunately, in Portugal also, as it was in Finland, uh, we introduced um, the physical distancing measures, the confinement measures early on, and we didn't see nothing as we have seen in um, other uh, countries. Uh, so I really believe that we learn from th those countries and actually our uh, healthcare system was spared to um, this kind of war zone uh, events. Anyway, uh, one of the lessons learned is that hospitals not at the center of the health system. At some point, we uh, in hospitals, we think that we are the most important in the system versus uh, the more differentiated personnel. Uh, but actually, we realize that during this epidemic, uh, our capacity is completely dependent on land community, community behavior. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I think this is going to give us the future and to understand that uh, hospitals do not function by themselves, they are part of a uh, healthcare system. Um, just to focus on the, the measures that we put in place um, in Portugal. So one of the first strategies that we started uh, mostly during uh, February was to define that uh, COVID patients, uh, COVID symptomatic patients should contact our uh, helpline and not to come to the emergency rooms. Um, and that, that was quite important, uh, so the patients would call the, 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 the helpline. Uh, we had some problems with the helpline. Uh, 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 our capacity was, was quite below uh, the number of contacts that we uh, arrived to have. But uh, um, I think in a constant uh, pressure, we also increased the capacity of this helpline. And um, also, um, we define and protect uh, first contact uh, health system points, uh, mostly we def uh, in hospitals uh, sites. So we defined uh, two hospitals that were for first for front line, one in Porto and uh, one in Lisbon, that were the first entry points. And immediately the emergency rooms also readapt to, um, to COVID. And after those two hospitals, when the, the infection was spread, uh, in the community, uh, uh, all the emergency rooms from the public system were prepared to uh, receive COVID uh, potential patients. Um, so, uh, as I told you, we, we designate this uh, uh, first hospitals to receive COVID-19 patients, and we start to mobilize uh, uh, surge and acute ICU capacity. Um, mostly, uh, we uh, started, uh, well, of course, with the uh, uh, infectious diseases wards, uh, but we immediately realized that they weren't uh, sufficient. So we started to increase the, the, the acute capacity in other wards, and we tried to put in place uh, negative pressure, individual rooms in different wards to increase uh, uh, our capacity and also to increase also uh, our ICU uh, capacity for that. Uh, we know that the capacity in Portugal was quite low uh, in uh, intensive care. So uh, actually what we have done mostly uh, was to identify uh, intens intensivists um, that uh, uh, could uh, work in intensive care units and also we identified other uh, medical specialists, other physicians that could uh, be trained to at least to, to comply as an anesthesiologist, for example, for intensive care or more close to intensive care. Also, we have done that for uh, nurses and other kind of personnel that have previous in experience on intensive care. They were identified and they were called uh, as needed to, um, to ICU. Uh, at the beginning, of course, we cancelled all the elective activity and we postponed act elective activity. Uh, we also, uh, well, of course, we continue to uh, uh, to operate uh, uh, priority and high priority patients, and of course urgent patients. 
and we also designate some uh, facilities that were COVID free like oncology uh, dedicated hospitals. Um, we also uh, expand services close to home and mostly for uh, mild cases. And in, that, in this sense, uh, primary care were quite uh, um, relevant. Uh, and the contact and the, 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 the uh, coordination with primary care units. Uh, also, uh, of course, we continue to uh, maintain essential uh, services, even though I'm going to show you in a little uh, bit what were the consequences of uh, cancelling most of the elective uh, non-emergent and priority um, uh, activity. So we also train and repurpose, of course, and mobilize healthcare workforce, as I told you. And we also um, introduce more uh, protections for uh, frontline healthcare workers. Actually, we had uh, in the beginning, uh, I believe as other countries in Europe, left lack of uh, PPEs and uh, tests, and that uh, posed a problem uh, for our hospitals. Uh, and it was quite a, a challenge to develop all this without uh, having the, um, all the needed equipment uh, for healthcare uh, workers. Uh, but at some point the problems were solved and it was possible also to increase the number of healthcare workers on the front line. Um, also, uh, I think this is quite important since the beginning, uh, the hospitals, uh, including my own, we started to develop mental health uh, um, phone lines and support to healthcare workers. And this is, was quite relevant due uh, to the possibility of burnouts or, or mental uh, health issues that healthcare workforce could, uh, could uh, be uh, impacted on. So one of the uh, other issues that we developed was just some photos this kind of flexibility and preparedness on emergency rooms. These are some photos from a, a major hospital in Porto, San Juan. Um, that's almost all emergency rooms. We have this kind of, uh, at the beginning, this uh, campaign hospitals uh, where we have uh, um, all the respiratory diseases, uh, patients were directed there and we did the triage for uh, COVID. Uh, we also introduced uh, different uh, pathways uh, to utilization uh, of uh, auxiliary exams as in imagiology and uh, lab analysis and all, all that uh, auxiliary exams. But mostly we try to create this new pathways for uh, COVID-19 potential uh, patients. Actually during the, even though we have this level of uncertainty, uh, at, nowadays we know what is the hospital role in COVID-19. And actually, it's a very uh, relevant role, uh, but not a completely measured role. So mostly asymptomatic patients are not going to need hospitals. Uh, mild cases can be treated at home. Uh, nowadays, in Portugal, we have this kind of uh, uh, app that can follow uh, patients at home, even though they can come to uh, the emergency room through the helpline, they are immediately discharged to home but we mostly hospitalize moderate cases. Uh, eventually they, they are going to have a shortened length of stays and we encourage uh, uh, the patients that can and have a possibility to be isolated to be discharged to home. Uh, severe cases, they need more uh, oxygen therapy and they will have uh, longer stays. And eventually we are talking about a very uh, dynamic uh, disease uh, with clinical uncertainties, some of these cases evolve to critical cases and in that sense we need uh, intensive care uh, and mechanical ventilation and eventually renal replacement therapy and uh, uh, ECMO. Uh, so this is the most uh, uh, difficult and complex patients um, and in that sense we continue to um, uh, I say that in the beginning um, we uh, yet and we foreseen problems in uh, mechanical uh, ventilators, but at some point we know that we have uh, a surplus, uh, even though we, we, we uh, bought uh, a high number of mechanical uh, ventilators, at this point we know that we are going to have a very, very high surplus of them. 
Uh, one of the tools that we started to use at the Portuguese Association was we develop a, a search planning tool. Nowadays, this uh, this searching plan tool helps us to determine the, the, the dynamic of the the, um, the dynamic of the, uh, the epidemic, the need for uh, uh, hospital beds in, for different uh, stages, as I told you, moderate cases, severe cases, and uh, critical cases. But also, it also help us to plan uh, human resources uh, to deal with it. And at this point, uh, even the, this tool predicts second waves and human resources that go with it, and also contract tracers uh, and the follow-up patients that own uh, human resources to comply with it. This tool was now adopted and uh, is currently being developed with uh, the World Healthcare Organization. I encourage it to for the participants uh, to use it. And if you want more uh, information about it, you can check it on the uh, WHO website that is available there and you can um, uh, use it. What are the current issues? Um, um, first of all, uh, at nowadays, uh, uh, the human resources capacity uh, continues to be uh, low. We have these uh, frontline healthcare workers that need to be replaced. Uh, it's not possible to imagine that they will continue to work uh, in this uh, uh, environment for the next month. So we need to replace this uh, uh, health, work, uh, uh, health workforce. Uh, we also face uh, mental health disorders uh, due to confinement, of course, and burnout of the health, healthcare workers. Uh, we are going to face higher healthcare needs in the future. Mostly the cancellation of elective activity led to uncertainty consequences. I will show you some data from us, uh, from Portugal. Uh, we have the increase of unemployment due and poverty due to the uh, economic collapse of our societies will all have consequences in uh, health needs. And of course, we are going to see this uh, increased demand in our uh, hospitals, but of course, in the healthcare system. And from the hospital side, we are going to, as Marco has uh, shown, we are going to, uh, we are seeing it, higher operational costs, mostly on PPEs, regular testing and clinical routine. Uh, even we, most of our clinic, uh, clinic services are outsourced. Uh, we need to re revise those contracts and increase uh, uh, the level of the clinic services within the hospitals. And of course, we are going to face uh, reduced productivity in uh, our hospitals and we need to hire more uh, personnel. Let me just show you what is the, the impact in our uh, in Portuguese NHS activity. In the left, you can see a graphic where uh, you have the monthly surgeries in March from 2013 to 2020. And you can see in March 2020, uh, it's the month that we, we reduced the lowest. Uh, and we have a, a, a cancellation of more than 20,000 elective surgeries. Uh, in April, it is worse. We believe that it can arrive to 13,000 uh, elective surgeries that were canceled. Uh, and this is quite uh, a problem. And I will show you a little bit uh, what we, uh, some early studies that can show you a little bit of these consequences. Also, in the right, you can see uh, secondary care medical appointments, the decrease. Uh, in different months and also in primary care medical appointments that you see uh, uh, lower um, activity numbers from the last at least seven years. The consequences, we have uh, at least three studies in Portugal. I'm going to show you one. Uh, this is a, an excess mortality estimation performed by a, a study of the medical school in Lisbon that's shown that uh, uh, we have a very, vi uh, and even outside COVID-19, we have seen a high mortality in the senior population, uh, above 65 years old. Uh, that is quite unexpected. So this uh, mortality estimation is really, really quite high. We, did, we don't see this in uh, uh, the age group below uh, 55. But actually, this study tried to analyze not only the unexpected mortality compared with the last 10 years, but they try to, um, to mostly to uh, compare the mortality with comparable months with low economic activity like we see in Portugal in the uh, summer months like July on, and August. So 
they try to compare the mortality with uh, months with very, very low economic activity, as we have seen due to confinement uh, that we currently, uh, or that we faced in Portugal during uh, mid-March and uh, April. What are the current steps or current uh, uh, challenges? Uh, mostly we need to manage this dual system of delivery, balancing uh, COVID and uh, uh, general services. We'll need to catch up cancelled activity. Um, as we have seen, we are talking about more than 60,000 surgeries, uh, talking about more than half a million uh, medical appointments. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, we increased the utilization of e health. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, we have several programs going on previous to COVID-19 pandemic uh, on re remote monitoring for COPD patients, for heart failure patients. Um, we have uh, telemedicine working since uh, 97, at least from the last century. But we had a big increase. Uh, for example, we have hospitals that replaced uh, medical appointments for telehealth appointments in two thirds during the, the, this, uh, the, the confinement period. Um, but actually, uh, we need to balance also e health and the possibility of e health and the quality of e health uh, when compared with face to face medical appointments. And that can be quite striking in the future, even though we are going to see an increased utilization of uh, e health uh, strategies. Uh, and of course, we need to maintain the flexibility to uh, second waves. In that sense, I believe that um, the human resources and the ICU is quite uh, relevant and uh, uh, we need to maintain the flexibility uh, and to plan this flexibility to face uh, second waves that will uh, happen uh, during the, the next months. Also another challenge I really believe that for us it will be quite striking is this two pandemics, the COVID-19 at the same time of the seasonal, seasonal flu uh, that we are going to see in the next fall, next winter, that will be quite striking to respiratory infectious diseases uh, that demand a lot from the healthcare system. Are we going to, uh, to, to comply with the needs? It will not be easy, uh, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, and by the moment, I think we need really to plan and to be ahead of the, the virus. So just to, to finalize, this is... Uh, brave new world. We don't know what uh, what we are going to expect. We live this in a world of uncertainty. Um, we were mostly in the field of chronic diseases and uh, uh, elective care and, and how to deal with uh, aging and uh, multimorbidity. Uh, but now we realize that uh, actually we have a very, very uh, complex infectious disease that we need to deal with it and it will not be easy. Uh, but I believe that uh, you know, within this kind of forums organized by EMA, it is possible to share experiences and to define new ways of uh, overcoming this uh, together at European level. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks so much for that presentation, uh, Dr. Lorenko. That was very interesting. We've got seven questions that have come in. Alexandra, I'll go to some of the questions for you. Um, so the most recent one from Mary Gobby says, how did you manage fear factor with staff? Actually, we face fear factor from staff, but also from uh, um, patients. Um, so we have seen also, and I think the most striking was for patients that, uh, for example, we also have seen the, the same effects that uh, uh, Marco presented from uh, in Finland, that we had also a reduction in our emergency room attendance by 40%, 50%. Uh, we have also cancellations of uh, auxiliary exams and cancellation of uh, medical appointments, uh, even though the ones that uh, we believe that were uh, prior, uh, relevant and uh, we have priority to them. Um, and in that sense, I think we still need to have a good communication uh, strategies towards the population to say to come to the hospital is safe. We have everything in place to uh, uh, allow you to get uh, treatments uh, uh, with all the safety. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, PPEs for all the patients that come to the hospital. Uh, we reduce, of course, visit uh, family attendance and, uh, and all, all the, 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 uh, the protocols uh, that we put in place. I, I really believe that in all hospitals, they are uh, sufficient 
to uh, um, to assure the safety to patients. From the healthcare staff, I believe uh, that we have some this kind of fear factor. Uh, I think it was overcome also with the confidence to treat those patients. But at this moment, what I'm uh, mostly concerned and we are, what we are mostly concerned uh, is uh, about the, the the overload of uh, work overload that uh, the frontline professionals are uh, supporting. So that's why I mentioned the need to uh, assure that, that they are replaced in the due time. Did you see an increase in e-health like Finland did? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, as I told you, I, one of our hospitals, our major hospitals, two thirds of the medical appointments, so something like uh, 70%, 75% uh, were replaced by uh, e-health appointments. Uh, even though I, what I think that we need to be uh, uh, concerned also in the future is that the quality of e-health is not the same as face-to-face -face, uh, medical appointments. Yes. And in that sense, yes. we need to rebalance it. Even though it's okay. a, a good strategy and a, a relevant strategy to reduce the possibility of infection and to increase, increase patient experience. Okay, there's another question for you from um, Elisaveta. Um, has the pandemic affected salaries, bonuses, retribution? I'm not sure if that was to you or to Marco, but um, um, could you speak to that one? No. Uh, what we are discussing now is uh, probably the need to, uh, to give some kind of bonus to healthcare professionals that are in the front line. So everyone is, the, we continue to have the, the same uh, payment systems or salary systems. Uh, we have some bonus on elective activity in, uh, and increased productivity. Uh, probably there are there are reduction in this kind of bonus payment because we don't have this uh, kind of activity or reduce this activity as I've shown. But in the overall, the the, the the system continues to be the same. And so, what about in terms of training? What sort of did you have? How did you face the training needs of your workforce in this time? Yeah, since February we started to to do some training on the utilization of PPEs, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, and then the training for the frontline professionals, not only in PPEs, but also uh, on the training. Also, the Portuguese Association, we started to make several webinars on planning uh, and mostly to share experiences in, uh, of the first hospitals that dealt with the epidemic and the other hospitals that joined the network, the COVID-19 network. Uh, in that sense, it's quite, quite relevant, but at the hospital levels, all hospitals started their own training programs for healthcare professionals. Uh, what I believe that can be and will be useful for the future, uh, and we are discussing this, is to uh, have some kind of uh, uh, fast tracks uh, and intensive trainings for um, uh, intensivists. Uh, by now in Portugal, it's a five-year medical specialty uh, we are discussing now when the need to increase the number of uh, uh, intensivists uh, to reduce um, uh, the training to two to three years uh, to increase our intensivist capacity. Right, okay. I'm going to come to some of the questions um, to Dr. Martiarvi, and I want to speak to one of the comments which was um, saying that there's an absence from somebody from one of the higher affected countries in this particular webinar. What we're doing in all of the series is trying to get coverage across all of Europe. Um, we had our first webinar on primary care. You can find that on our website, and that was presented by a doctor from Spain talking about primary care resources. And in our future webinars, so that'll include, there's more webinars to come on hospitals, there's webinars on procurement, um, and we're also going to have another session, which is purely questions and answers. And we're trying to bring in the full diversity of people across Europe so that we can tackle this uh, as a Europe together. Um, Dr. Makiavi, can I come to you now for some of the questions? Um, so um, the first sort of four questions were for you. Um, I want to come to the one about um, one from Rachel Gifford. Did you focus on repurposing or retaining medical staff to increase COVID patient capacity? And if so, how did you do that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so... As I mentioned, we used uh, the nurses and doctors from the surgical departments uh, because uh, nurses working in OR environment, they already have many basic skills you need uh, to get around in, in ICU. And they were trained in, in, uh, in one week training and, and uh, they've been then uh, uh, also trained in the work in the ICUs and, and, and we have now 
uh, over 500 nurses capable of working in ICU environment, and our goal is to to increase it to 1,500 in the next uh, next couple of weeks. So that's our resource in the beginning. But we realize that the, in the future we need more. We we probably have to hire more staff from outside because there is this normal uh, work still be still to be done, and we we reckon this is going to last uh, a long time. This uh, this uh, new normal situation. Yeah, okay. There's another question from Lizette and Gellen, which is what steps are you taking to get the hospitals as central arm um, part of the network? Is value-based healthcare one of the options? We are discussing on value-based healthcare, but uh, currently we are in the phase of uh, uh, changing our uh, EMR. Uh, hospital will have the same EMR than the, the primary care and social care also, first time in the world. And we are hoping that uh, with this, we can uh, have real uh, mutual processes and, and, and also uh, data collection and, and the management will be much easier, also quality management and, and safety management. Well, on that note, I want to come to you and also to Alexandra. There's a question from Yeli Saka about um, thanking you for your presentations and asking you about your investment in data systems. Is there anything you can add about your investments into data systems for responding to COVID? Um, no, no, no. We, we didn't do any, any extra in this respect. Okay, terrific. Uh, Alexandra, can you add anything there? I don't think that we are using um, at this point. Uh, we well, we increase the the, the the utilization of the health tools. Uh, we uh, even have a tool that uh, can follow up patients at home. Um, but in that sense of the well, data science and utilization of data, I don't think uh, we are uh, we have a very very long way to um, to use it. Uh, even though, uh, for example, uh, we have lots of personnel. Uh, working remotely, even from the hospital, and in that sense, even the increase of uh, new technologies uh, was uh, very widely used. Um, and even for um, uh, ELF, we have even medical doctors at home uh, providing uh, uh, tele appointments. Uh, but in the sense of data science and data analytics, uh, we don't uh, uh, use it as we should do. What we are thinking now is to use it on repurposing healthcare services and really finding uh, pathways and circuits within the hospital and to use data science for it. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm just scanning for any last questions. Oh, there were a couple of questions, including one from Maria Yeti about um, the, what happened when um, doctors or healthcare professionals in your hospitals were infected? What was the impact of that? And what kind of size of impact did that have like proportionally on your, on your workforce? I would answer very briefly and then I got to run to the next one. <laughs> so uh, uh, luckily we have had only very few this kind of uh, infections of the personnel. The worst one was around cardiac surgeons and we almost had to shut down our cardiac surgery functions in the very beginning, but we managed and uh, when we talk about uh, uh, one infected doctor or a nurse, then you might have uh, uh, one to five, up to 10 in quarantine around. But luckily we haven't had any close down of wards or, or departments and, and, and hopefully not also in the future. But there is a small concern. Uh, there are a few wards where uh, uh, inevitably, even with good PPE and instructions, uh, you, you have infected uh, patients infecting uh, nurses and doctors and then and, and there are some some things we really don't fully understand yet uh, this this uh, virus is very contagious thank you very much for your time today dr Machiavi. that was really helpful to have your contributions and um we'll thank be speaking to you soon and you take good health for all bye bye thanks um dr lorenko is there anything else you want to add Having glanced with the questions, this, is there any uh, final comments? No, for this uh, point, uh, yeah, we, uh, we don't know if the healthcare professionals were infected within the, uh, their functions or in the community, uh, but we have something like 10% of the, um, the infected uh, patients within the country are healthcare professionals. Uh, of course, we had some professionals and uh, 
Uh, we had hospitalized patients uh, during February that weren't tested and they were hospitalized uh, without all the precautions. So we clinically we thought that there were other conditions and they infected the healthcare professionals during the, that time. Uh, of course, we know that uh, this is a very high risk uh, situation, but mostly what we are concerned uh, is uh, in non or, or uh, in COVID free areas uh, where even though uh, healthcare professionals uh, wear uh, PPEs uh, and even uh, patients, there, there are the, the, the areas that are more uh, risky for healthcare professionals. Uh, in that sense, I, th I think healthcare professionals were quite uh, uh, brave to deal with the epidemic. Uh, and even though they, they, uh, they were, uh, several of them get infected, they never uh, give up of uh, providing care. Thank you very much um, for that. I, I think we've got to most of the questions. There might be a few outstanding. Um, I did mention this for several other webinars. So I, I see there's a question about BME communities. We won't have time to speak to that, but I will have added that to our list to maybe do a dedicated webinar on that. If you have any questions that haven't been answered and they're really important and you would like a quick answer, do email us. Um, uh, Dr. Alexander Lorenko, I really appreciate during this very busy time you making time to speak and present to us. Um, that was a great presentation and, and, and our thanks. Mm -hmm. I also thank everyone for, for participating. Um, we know you're busy and we think the work that you're doing is the most important work that's needed in Europe right now. So thank you for your dedication, everyone. And um, stay in touch with our future webinars. And if you need anything else from us, do let us know. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.